time to reap the harvest of men Fish them out of the sea of destruction Show them the way Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot, our blemish ministry. So glad you're here today. We have an amazing podcast today because not only do we have one guest, we have two. Chad's with us as well as Ken. Uh, Chad, you know well from prior podcasts, and Ken is going to be new to the podcast, but he's not new to ministry. He's been a pastor for quite some time, almost two decades, and we're going to talk with him about a scripture that God showed him to to illuminate him about what's going on in our court systems and, and the lack of justice in society today. And we're going to see that from Isaiah chapter 59. But before we begin doing so, we're going to go ahead and pray. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to come together and to minister your word from your word. We don't want to hear from flesh today, Father. We want to hear from your Holy Spirit. So we're asking that no flesh would speak, but that you would minister to your people through this podcast so that the end of the podcast all of us will be different than we were at the beginning. We'll be encouraged by you. We'll be in, uh, enlightened by you. We'll be shown the truth by you so that we can stand on the truth and on your word and understand what we're going through and why and how to handle it and how to be led of you, Father. We just praise you and thank you for this. In Jesus' mighty name, in the mighty name of Jesus, I bind up every demonic spirit from uh, attacking me in this room or Chad where he is or Ken where he is. We come against any demonic spirit that would interfere or try to hinder this message in any way, shape, or form in Jesus' mighty name. And we loose that only God's word would come forth from all three of us in the mighty name of Jesus. We also come against any demonic spirits that would be attacking the listener, wherever he or she may be, whether in the car, at their computer, on a walk, it doesn't matter. We bind up all demonic spirits and command them to leave each and every listener. And we bind you up from being able to uh, hinder this message from being received by the listener or to convolute it or distort it in any way. We come against those tactics in Jesus' mighty name. We command you to leave these people alone, and we loose that only the truth would be received today to the edification of the three of us as well as to all those who listen. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. So uh, Ken uh, wrote me an email the other day, and it had this this scripture from Isaiah 59 in it, and it speaks to the lack of justice that would occur in an end times world. And I just want to start off, Ken, by asking you, what, how did that scripture come to your mind and, and what, what brought it to your attention? Well, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing. So I've been studying Isaiah 56 and 59. What we have in 59 is Isaiah, 114 or so years before God judges Judah in, in 586 B.C., uh, you know, who was warned through Isaiah, through Ezekiel, through Jeremiah, he's expressing where the nation and the courts had gone, far from God. Um, of course, there's always light at the end of the tunnel, and with God, it's not the train, it's God. The next chapter, he's not going to do these things, and one of the things that really stuck out to me is this, he said in verse 4 in chapter 16, and, and they will carry your little girls home to you. And knowing you guys knowing my situation, so it really has caught my attention. But specifically, um, you know, Isaiah says there's no justice among us. You know, there's there's no justice in the court. So so that's what you know has peaked, why I my curiosity was piqued on this. Right. So just a little background. Ken has been fighting to have access to his children, who were all practical terms was kidnapped from him much like what Chad has experienced as well in terms of the courts just giving wives in this case. It's not always the woman who's doing this. Sometimes men do it too. But predominantly, the larger percentage of cases like this are women taking the children from the men uh, and the court system helping them to be kidnapped. And so they're experiencing a great drought of justice. And The scripture portion from Isaiah 59, it starts in verse 14 that he sent me. It says, And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. And if you look at that first word, judgment, that's speaking of a type of judgment that's pronounced judicially. So the root word for that in um, Hebrew is mishpat. And it means a verdict, either favorable or unfavorable, pronounced judicially, especially a sentence or formal decree. So 
you might read that scripture in the King James and say, and judgment is turned away backward. That might just, you might just read that and think, well, that just simply means that people have <coughs> bad judgment in their lives. But no, this is literally referring to a judicial decree, that type of judgment that a, a judge would hand out. And it's literally saying that it's judgments turned away backward, justice standeth afar off, and truth is fallen in the street. And so what we found, what we find in the court systems is that the people that are being helped are the ones that are actually wrong and the people that are being um, not just discouraged but penalized are the ones that are actually in the right. Have you guys seen that pattern? Uh, in, the, in our nation's courts? Yeah, so recently especially, I've been involved with a lot of different people. Probably I've interacted with a few women, but mostly it is men. And these women have experienced the same as the men have, which is they've had their children taken from them. They seem like genuine, good, honest people, a lot of them professing even to be Christian. And I can't imagine they've done anything so horrible to have their kids taken completely from them or minimized to a point where they only get them four plus days a month, which is my case. Now, Ken is worse, and he can probably share, but thankfully I, I've been privileged to meet Ken. It's it's just really sad to see anyone who is just a normal person or a person who's really uh, close to God, either way, to, to have themselves diminished in the court system this way. It's almost gotten to a point of ridiculousness that it does seem like the the people that are getting punished in the courts are the ones that are professing Christians, in my view, whether it's the woman or the man. Like the ones that I've seen that have been on the short end of the stick have often been professing Christians. And our next verse in Isaiah says, excuse me, this is verse 15 of Isaiah 59. It says, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. So essentially, it's the person that's trying to do right, that's trying to depart from evil, that the enemy through the court systems is trying to ex extract their pound of flesh from, or worse than that, to destroy them outright, because many people who have lost their children have literally got, turned to suicide and great forms of depression uh, due to this level of abuse. Ken, have you seen well, have you seen people push to the edge like that? Yeah, it's it's post traumatic stress, and and when your kids get taken away, male or female, you know, for a long time they thought, well, it doesn't affect the men. Well, baloney, you know, and and I'm a part just like like uh, Chad is. A, a part of uh, in social media, part of these uh, a large network of, of people who have been done wrong by the courts with child custody and or alienation. Which, you know, when the courts do this, it is alienation. But you also have the alienation of the other parent. Um, and you'll see these guys on there, and then somebody will go on their 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 page and say, "Hey, we're sorry to inform you, but he took his life last night." Mm. And you see this. Uh, and it, it, it's very disturbing. And, you know, losing a child like this can cause, uh, you know, these things to happen in your life. A great deal of depression, uh, just becoming despondent, distraught, de depressed, uh, to the point where they say, I, I, I can't do this any longer, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, and it's, a, it's a very sad thing. It's pandemic in our society and not just here, the, the EU, Australia, you know, you, you read about it there too, but you know, ultimately that verse, verse 15 that you're talking about, basically it's saying there's no more truth and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. Right. And we, we see that in the family courts. If, if Satan can take out the father, then you take out the family. If you take out the family, then you take out the church. If you take out the church, you take out the society. It's so and true it's no because they're all, they're, all, they're all built upon each other. You know, in, in the beginning of that chapter, God says why this occurs. He says, in the first verse of 59 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. 
But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleaded for truth. They trust in vanity, and they speak lies, and they conceive mischief, and bring forth iniquity. And so I'm not saying the people that are suffering the loss of their children are doing this. They're the ones in my, that I've seen that are actually choosing to do the right thing. But I'm saying our nation and the world as a whole, but we can especially testify for the U.S. that that we have turned into a cesspool of sin. We've killed 60 million babies since 73. We farm out uh, the most porn worldwide of any other nation. Um, we're basically farming out Satanism through uh the media and through Hollywood and our, our sins as a nation have found us out and we are, we have become corrupted due to the iniquity. And a large reason that's happened is, is the failure of the church in the sense that the church has been half stepping and fence riding and wanting a little bit of the world and a little bit of God and not really representing him or having uh, the true signs of, of a believer follow us. You know, we've, we, we as a church have to get it right and to become without spot or wrinkle and, and holy without, and without blemish. And that's kind of the, the purpose of um, the end times tribulation period is to get people to seriously consider their station and to line up their lives with the word. But another thing that kind of comes of this in um, chapter three of Isaiah, it says in verse four, and I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. And it's talking about um, Israel because of their sin. He says, and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another and every one by his neighbor. And the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. So and then if we skip on to um, verse uh, four, 12, it says, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. And so we see this uh, spirit of Jezebel in the form of modern feminism and how it's turned everything on its head. It's made every man the aggressor, and, and all, even when they're the victim. It's uh, it's turned justice on its head. They have a narrative that they're going to promote and support and enforce with guns at the hands of the judges. And uh, you you get what we have today due to the sins of a nation and the corruption that have come. And it's not just our nation, but the whole world. I think that we are growing and encouraging a society of uh, of. I guess feminism, which also in the same way is the Jezebel. You know, it just really, um, you, fathers are just as much responsible for this situation, raising their daughters, making them the princess, encouraging them to be this way, and they grow up to become this Jezebel. And so we're feeding into this. So fathers are just much to blame, but the women have the control, they have all the control. So a good Christian woman has the control to raise their daughters and say, no, I'm not going to be a Jezebel. Follow my example. And I want you to also not be a Jezebel and encourage those they have influence in their midst and maybe educate men and say, hey, father, don't don't do that with your daughter, you know, because this is what you're doing. You're feeding into her Jezebel. You know, I mean, there's just so much to say in that that realm. But I just think that um, it's so out of control now and they're it's so replicating the defiance they see because christ the head of the man man head of the woman the jezebel spirit is a spirit of witchcraft which we know that witchcraft is as the sin of disobedience and that defiance and disobedience that wives are showing to their husbands that are walking with the lord is teaching their children to replicate it and now we have a, a society of the man not having any of the, the proper God-given authority in his own household or, or much less in, in society as a whole. And um, you're seeing this uh, borne out in the, in the courts with the lack of justice that occurs. I'd like to add to the disobedience um, control. So the witchcraft also has an element of control. So the daughters and the wives are both displaying this disobedience to the father or to the husband 
in a family relationship. And there's also a, uh, a control piece to it. So the, the, the wife is trying to control the husband and is accomplishing it. And it's being encouraged in the common modern day churches today or ignored. And the daughters are trying to control their fathers as well or control the, the narrative as well. So um, fathers are allowing this to happen, as I did in my home. The point of the scriptures in chapter three about women and children, children ruling their men the court systems themselves are being used as a methodology to do so. There's nothing the man can do in today's society to reassert um, his proper position as head of the family. Because they have the threat of force against the man as the head of the family, and sometimes it's proper that it's that way because there are women that are legitimately abused that need to file restraining orders, that need to uh, do whatever they can to uh, be protected. I don't, I don't blame women for doing that, that where that's the case. But oftentimes it's part of the modus operandi of the attorney for the woman to say, okay, we're going to file a restraining order. We're going to paint him as a threat. And then we're going to um, take advantage of the family court system to cause him to have limited access to his children and to have to pay you a whole bunch of money every month. To your point, interesting enough, I've got a friend, his uh, ex-wife's a attorney is representing his ex-wife and that same attorney is representing a friend of his in his divorce case so his friend who is a man is being represented by the same attorney the attorney is playing the games that you play for the female to take kids away but then he's not fighting hard for the man to have 50 50 custody and win he's destroying the man's life and so he's trying to tell his friend that uh hey wake up guy look what he's done look what he does for women and look what he's not doing for you how bizarre and the guy's not figuring it out yet until he loses everything will he figure it out and then it's too late nearly right so, there's no more money left to do to do anything at that point uh, so these attorneys know the gigs, what, what's going on, and they're playing, if, if they don't predominantly uh, support female or, or males in, in their situations, um, you see it more clearly when they represent both a man or a woman in their, their divorce situation and how you know they go for the jugular, they play all the, the horrible games against the man uh, when they're representing a woman, and when they're representing a man, they don't fight hard at all. They tell them, no, you should only be able to see your kids four plus days a month. And you need to pay significant amount of money, more than you can afford, more than you ever paid before to your ex-wife to keep your kids from you so that you only get to see them four days a month. You're paying for your children to be kidnapped from you. Absolutely is what it is. Then you have it where, uh, like in my case, you only see out of my children, I only see one or two, but not all of them. So they're being completely kept from me, which is I only get four days a month and I don't even get that with some of them. You know, I only get to see them once or, or twice a year for moments. And there's no enforcement by the court. If you were doing that in your situation and you were withholding the children, you would have gone to jail. But in, in your case, there's no enforcement, even of what they put in place by the courts. Yeah, they're not going to put a mom in jail. No doubt. They will not do it. Uh, but a man, I don't think they would skip a beat. I have a friend now who uh, they're trying to put him in jail. But before they put him in jail, which he's going to court in, in uh, this coming week, they put his son in jail, his 14-year-old son in jail. Because his son wants to see his father, and they won't let him see his father, and he's being abused by his mother and his mother's live-in new husband. Wow. And he's crying out, pleading for help to be safe from the abuse from the, the live-in husband uh, that her, his mom just married, and the abuse from those two. And he's just pleading with the court to say, please let me see my father. And instead, the judge threw him in jail. I'm sure this judge has broken some laws, and hopefully the judge will be in trouble for this. But I'm telling you, the courts are turned upside down. And that young man had pleaded to be heard by the judge, and the judge would never allow him to speak in, in, on his own behalf 
Is that correct? For about a, a year now, the judge has refused to listen to the son. He's going to be 15 real soon. He's very intelligent, very good grades. In fact, when I saw video of the son, I thought that he was much older than he is because he's so articulate and so smart about this stuff that's going on. I, I haven't spoke with his son, but I spoke with his father a couple of times. Very nice guy. Very concerned about his son's situation. Is he still in juvenile at this point or has he been released? In juvenile at this point. His mother's Has it been like 10 days or so or how many days has it been? We don't know. Uh, yeah, it's been about eight days maybe now, maybe 10. There, it sounds like his mother is trying to extract him from the juvenile court, uh, juvenile jail cell, to put him into a psych ward and have him heavily su uh, seduced by drugs, Sedated. which is also a form of witchcraft and pharmacia. Absolutely. And we've seen that before where mothers have tried to put sons that don't want to be with them into mental wards where they're going to have to take some kind of antidepressants or strong pharma pharmaceutical drug that's just going to make them numb and not care anymore. Yeah, the so, mother's saying that the son who is 14 is crazy because he wants to see his father. Now it's so extreme that he actually probably wants to live with his father. Right. But She's pushed him so hard. He'll say that again. I, I interrupted you. Yeah. Bef uh, before he was simply just wanting to see his father. Now I think he wants to live with his father. But there's, I think there's a protection order and preventing the father from having any communication with his children at all. And the father's done nothing wrong. And now the mother has pushed so hard she's lost that young man forever. I mean, he'll if he's a Christian young man, he's going to forgive her, but he's not going to forget. He, she, he's going to have to go no contact with her completely. You know, it's only three more years till he's 18 and he makes all the decisions for himself and She's lost him forever at this point, but it's not without having done a great deal of damage, you know, against him, you know. Absolutely. That that son, you, you, he, he, he probably feels like his mother doesn't love him to prevent him from seeing his own son. This is just demonic. It's so evil. And it, it, it's funny how, and it's not just women. Women, we're not trying to throw all, all the women under the bus. We know that Christian women have been attacked in the same way. Again, it's a lesser percentage. Our experience of the three of us that are on the line right now is, is because we're men, we've experienced the opposite and we've, we've seen a lot of this. Uh, but I will say that once the woman crosses a certain line in her heart, the vindictiveness and the retaliation and the cold-blooded nature of completely <coughs> keeping away a child from the other spouse when they're not willing to endure that for themselves and, and not having any empathy at all to do that to the other spouse, it's beyond the pale, the cruelty of it and the, the wickedness of it. It's barbaric. It seems that the modern-day church condones it or just thinks it's normal, just like they seem to not have much of a stance on uh, murdering babies every day at Planned Parenthood or where, where not, whatnot. It's all tied together. All of it is witchcraft. It's all tied together in witchcraft with witches, with warlocks, with followers of Baal and Molech. They've sacrificed children to their idols, and that's exactly what's happening. They want to limit exposure to the Christian parent. Uh, whether they know it in their in their own intellects or not, the demons that are in them are driving them to limit exposure to the Christian parent and to train them up in the methods of Satan. And that is if they keep them. And all the while, they're sacrificing the child um, to their false god and teaching them to serve that false god. And it's it's the epitome of wickedness, but it speaks to where we are in, in history and the end times and how this is such terrible English. The good are trying to be gooder and the bad are getting badder. They're getting much worse. And it's going on within what calls itself the church. I mean, these people, they just have no remorse. There's no, they, their consciences are seared with a hot iron and they actually think that they're doing God's work. You know, Jesus said that people would think they do God's work to kill you. Well, they think they do God's work to bring their judgment, their faults, corrupt judgment upon you because you deserve it. That's exactly where we are in our world. These people show the way for me, convince the courts to, to alienate them from me, and then further alienated them, and then abandoned one to me. Uh, how can a 
Christian that has the Holy Spirit living in them do that? Because Hebrews 12 says if, if you're, and I'm going to give you the, the Tetris uh, translation, if you sin against God, he's going to take you to the woodshed. Yep. And so these, these people that do these things to these, you know, it's abuse. that They abuse these children this way, either through abandonment or alienation or through the courts. Uh, it's child abuse unequivocally. And how can you, if you say the Holy Spirit lives in you, do this and not be under conviction about it? So, you know, we, we've got a, a lot of people who are just doing Satan's work. Uh, in the name of why well, I need my freedom, I want my freedom, uh, you know, th- th- God is okay with this, when clearly he's not. And, and that's where we we come to as a society, because, there, you know, back to Isaiah 59, there is no justice. And what does God say about himself? He says over and again, I love justice. Here's the rest of that chapter of Isaiah 59. It's actually speaking of what God's going to do as a result of all this. And in verse 16, it says, And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So this this verse is actually a messianic prophecy of Jesus. So it says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, according to, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. So he is going to judge uh, judge all of this severely. And the reason for it is because he just can't continuously put up for it, put up with it. And we know that in Revelation it says that um, Jesus says to Jezebel, I gave you space to repent. He's giving them the space to repent. He's giving them the chance to make it right. And and for some reason, he gives them a a bunch of that. But eventually, it's all going to catch up to them. And, you know, it says in Revelation, I will put you into a bed of languishing, speaking to Jezebel, if she doesn't repent. And God's just judgment is going to come on this world for all of this. And, you know, I've said this before in other podcasts that what we're going through is um, obviously it's horrible, but it is in order so that God can bring his just judgment on these people. He's going to show them what they did, how many chances they got, how they were hurting the innocent. Like they make the innocent into a prey. They specifically try to destroy the innocent. And that's what I, you know, none, none of the three of us have been perfect in the sense that we haven't made mistakes. We could have been better, um, better to, you could have been better to your spouses or better parents, but you did the best you could. And when you made a mistake, you self-corrected. And the problem with Jezebel is she hates people like that. And she wants to paint you as way worse than you are because she's way worse than that. So she'll paint you with lies because the truth will hurt her. You wanted to Raise your children right. That makes her sick to her stomach. She can't bear it. She's so wicked and evil that that spirit is so wicked and evil that people that are trying to do right as uh, parents and and um, spouses, they're they're going to be punished even worse and seen as weak and as simps and cucks and and chumps and meant and deserving of their ire and their wrath and whatever they can do to uh, destroy you. And then to to our earlier point, Ken mentioned this about people that he knew that have already committed suicide due to this kind of abuse through child alienation. And really, it's kidnapping. It's legalized kidnapping. Well, and, and what's what's the outcome for Jezebel? But what, what is that in Revelation? What is, what is the outcome for those who have aided and abetted her? Well, it, it makes it clear that her children, it says in her children, she'll be, put to, she'll be brought to death. And to me, her children are her spiritual offspring that come through the fornication. You know, we can read it directly. It's in Revelation 2.22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So... I, 
I just want to say a little caveat. I don't think that means that, uh, say, in your cases, or even my case, that our children are going to be killed with death, those literal children. I'm speaking, right. I believe that's speaking of spiritual children, the ones that she was able to seduce and create more evil, wicked offspring of herself. You know, those that right. choose right. her evil ways. Some so, people might call them flying monkeys. Enablers and Ahabs. Enablers right. and Ahabs within their family, within their friends, within their church. Exactly. And I've, I've seen that. I've seen, not, not just with me, I've seen it with other people. They go to, to different people, especially somebody in spiritual authority, to, for counsel to get them to agree with them. And, you know, they'll be rejected by anybody who's godly because they'll say, you know, what you're doing is not right. Uh, but eventually they'll find somebody to get on their bandwagon and they say, they'll, so they can say to themselves, see there, even so-and-so agrees with me. They, can, they did the same thing to Nehemiah, you know, Sam Ballant and Tobiah, those guys that they, they, would, they would send out the letter, you know, we're doing this, Nehemiah, and so-and-so agrees with it, as if so-and-so has some kind of authority. They just wanted to convince themselves through somebody else's approval that they're doing the right thing when they know that they're not. And it seems this authority, you know, say with, if it's a church pastor or associate pastor or whatever, their authority will override the authority of the man of the house of the, the which is really the high priest of the house is the father. And they will do things and tell that wife things that give her license to disobey the leading of the father uh, by, by Christ's headship. I've witnessed this in my situation where uh, supposedly pastors have told the Jezebel to not let me see my children. Yeah, it was their advice. At least that's how it got back to you, because you never know what's the truth anymore with regard to that. Right. But, but one exactly. thing I do, I do want to say is that often we think that the Jezebel controls the narrative with everybody. And um, some encouraging things have come to, to my attention lately that show that's not always the case. Usually, if it's a true Jezebel narc, they are often hated in all their other circles, but they make it seem to the isolated victim that everybody believes their narrative. And then you, it makes you very insecure that you don't realize that other people actually see that person for how they really are. Not everybody's drunk the Kool-Aid. Would you, what would you say to that, Chad? Yeah, so um, I've heard you share that with me plenty of times and it's been very encouraging. Um, I'm starting to see it a little bit in my situation, um, but uh, I've had other testimonies of people sharing it in their uh, situations who have gone further. Sometimes it takes some time for this to be revealed. And, um, you know, for me, it's still I'm still in the thick of things. You find uh, out later on that all of their colleagues actually can't stand them, you know, now. That I have witnessed uh, very recently a situation in that regard, yes. And so uh, I'm, be I'm becoming a very much a, a believer of what you're saying there, Doug. What do you think, Ken? Have you seen that where you've seen, in, on the one hand, the Jezebel's controlling the narrative and the victims lives a life of fear that everybody is ostracizing them and can't stand them because everyone in the world is a flying monkey, but then later on you find out that that the Jezebel was actually disliked by most people that knew him or her. Yeah. What happens is, is their toxicity, their toxicity, uh, it, it gets on everybody else. Cause, cause let's face it. Any, anyone who wants to make another person's life miserable is miserable. Mm. Happy people don't try to beget, miserable people but they don't try to make other people miserable only miserable people do that so they're miserable everywhere they are and their, their co-workers their if they're in college their school classmates you know the, the people they're around they, they're just they don't they get to where they don't like being around this person uh, especially if they haven't known them now they're they're real easy to hook you know in, in bass fishing terms to, to throw the lure out and set the hook into these people and reel them in and, and then, you know, flatter them and keep the lies uh, perpetuated with them. And they'll, so they'll keep those people in their lives to support them. Uh, but it, but I find it that, that 
they become so toxic, especially people that have not known them before, that they, they don't want to be around them. You know what's interesting? Like, oh, absolutely. But what's interesting about all this and just tying it back to the court system is that the narrative is hard for the Jezebel to control out in public where she is constantly doing things to not just annoy, but to injure and hurt other people or to belittle. They're very condescending and people, um, the jig is up with other people per, often that have to spend any inordinate amount of time with that person, whether it's at work or school or wherever. But in the court system, the opposite can happen when the entirety of the court proceedings is all pivoting around the narrative being controlled in favor of the narc. So your attorney can't say anything without being shut down by the judge that's going to make a case that's going to shine the light on the narc or the Jezebel uh, properly. Uh, the attorney for your Jezebel is given an ordinate, an ordinate amount of time to make her case, and then your your attorney, if you have one, is shut down. They're doing all kinds of things to to control the narrative in the court where they have more control. Have you guys seen this go on? Exactly. It, it happened to me exactly the way you're describing it. My attorney was shut down. I couldn't say certain things that the other person could say. And, and it was this particular judge had made up his mind from the beginning. Uh, you know, and so here I get most of my rights taken away with, with my daughters and I committed no crimes and broke no laws. Um, and every, there was a, there was such a demonic presence in the courtroom. Uh, there was, as, as the Old Testament, of the, the old King James says, there was gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. Just there's this anger and showing of, you could see people with my, the, the other attorney, you could see her incisors. Like I felt like, uh, you know, that scripture came to mind, gnashing of teeth, and uh, there was just this demonic anger. But the other thing there was, somebody who 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 is a Jezebel, I believe that they have a super demonic power about them. Because they're, they're, they, they're, they're successful, for lack of a better word, and they're evil. And there's this power that goes along with them. And I, I think it's just, I, I think it's, it, it, it's a, a power. Obviously, it's, it's from the enemy, the devil, this, the, the old snake, the old serpent. Uh, but, but there's a demonic power with that. And in, in the courts, uh, I believe sometimes the judges are intimidated and manipulated by that. Or just they're just in total agreement with it because, you know, I think a lot of these judges, and we've said this before, are, are Masons, and they are part of the overall attempts by Satan to manipulate society into his image, into what is exactly opposite and counter to the biblical order of things. And, of course, there's the financial gain they get from it that the federal government gives a dollar to every court that gets one dollar in a— uh, child support. So there's all kinds of financial incentives for them to do wrong. And, uh, that's part of the corruption. Have you seen that as well, Chad? Oh, yes. And so, uh, this same, uh, gentleman whose son was put into the juvenile court, the judges are obviously against the man in this situation. Disrespect talks down to him. I mean, just crossing the line by a mile. If he was and on the street, he would never talk to that man that way. That's right. If they right. were just no. two people on the street, they would. These are, you know, you know, guys that don't hit the gym wearing black robes. But from that, that bully pulpit of the of the courtroom, they sure do act like bullies. Oh, they're sweet as uh, pie to the woman, and just. Chew Absolutely. this man out left and right like he's a piece of crap. Mm. Absolutely. That was exactly what happened in my situation. And, uh, you know, he, he yelled at me. I was trying to answer a question. And he yelled and raised his voice at me. And, and to her, it was, oh, yes, okay. You know, 
it just it was just sickening. And, and I, you know, where I am, where I live, uh, Avalon is a relatively small town. So you know people who who go to church with this judge. You know people who know him. And oh, he's such a godly man. And and I'm I say, wait, are we are we talking about the same person? Those were his and, flying monkeys, weren't they? Oh yeah, absolutely. So he's got this reputation. Now he doesn't with the attorneys. The attorneys don't like him because he talks this way to them. And I, I saw that in the Fort Worth. Uh, but but uh, you know here this particular judge there, there's an attorney who has been who's going through their own personal divorce and has been advised by the other attorneys move to another county so that you don't have the chance of being in this judge's courtroom. Now that's sad. And Ken, you're talking about the same judge that treated you in extreme disrespect. And I've spent enough time talking to Ken. I feel like I know him and trust him very well. And I know that if they can do what they did to Ken in the courtroom, that a good upright, you know, uh, man in, in our society, but also a great Christian man who has been in the ministry as long as you have, Ken. A pastor uh, for over a decade at that point, right? It, 15 well, years. Exactly. Full-time ministry for, I'm in my 29th year. 29th year, and had been a pastor in the same town as the judge for all those years, and if he went after a pastor. You know, it says here uh, in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 5, I, I read this before, but I want to reinforce the end of this verse. It says, And the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another, and everyone by his neighbor, the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. So here we have what's happened in our society is these people that are, are dishonest, they're corrupt, they're foul. They are treating people that are trying to live above board and live righteously as dirt beneath their feet. It's the base treating the honorable with contempt. And there's yeah, another it's, scripture it's in the Proverbs where, or maybe it's Ecclesiastes, Solomon was writing, and he says, I've seen, I've seen um, servants on horses and the honorable walking. It's trying to give this image that these base people are being exalted and the honorable people are being put down. But it's only temporary, guys. It doesn't last forever. This is only going to go on for so long. It's all part of the enemy's plan. Nations oftentimes repeat what's happened in the Bible. You know, Isaiah was prophesying to Israel and Judah about 114 or 15 years before Nebuchadnezzar came in in 586 B.C. and, and took everybody, you know, took them as slaves and destroyed the temple, you know, destroyed Jerusalem. And Jeremiah was the, was the preacher there for decades, preaching, basically echoing what Isaiah had said. And, and Jeremiah said, you know, if, if you don't do this, this is going to happen. One of, the, one of the things they talked about over and over, as we see in Isaiah, is, that, is justice was no longer. The, the righteous were oppressed and done wrong by the courts. And one of the things Jeremiah talked about is he said, you've made slaves out of your own people, and, and, and they could agree to slavery for six years, and you had to let them go. That was one of God's judgments on Judah, because they had not freed their own people from slavery. So they're, they're trying to make the Lord's servant, the enemy's trying to make here, here now, the Lord's servant a slave to the court, a slave to child yes. support. You know, and if he, if he can do that, he, he renders the father ineffective, which affects the family, which affects the church, which affects the, our society. And he's enslaved and, to and these child support it. payments that are ridiculously large, like Chad said earlier, and then the man can't even do his ministry. He's so caught up no. in trying to make money to pay... He's a slave. He's, he's, he thinks he's free because he gets in a car and drives to work in the morning and drives home at night, but he's not. He's enslaved indirectly or to the courts to and to the woman. You, well, you're enslaved and you're forced to work a couple of full-time jobs and, and, and you know, try to raise a kid in the meantime. And it, it just, you know, it, it, it takes all your time. But, but let me tell you, you're right. It all is coming to a head. Look, look at where we are in, in our country. Everybody is wanting justice. That's why people voted for this president, because he promised to drain the swamp. Now, like him or not, that's why people voted for him. 
And you, you see why he was elected, because people wanted justice. They're wanting justice now. We see all these pedophiles from California to New York, these Hollywood people uh, to Epstein. We, we see this happening going, finally justice is occurring, but we're not seeing justice in our courts. Why? Because Satan has wanted it this way, but I, I also think we're, we're on, on the edge of judgment, just like Israel was on the edge of judgment. Because justice had gone away. Right. And again. It's a precursor know, to the tribulation. Absolutely. And, and I think another thing is, I think God has allowed this to happen because he wants us to be sick of this world. To look forward to the next. That's a really good point. What, it, what Paul says, he said, comfort people with these words about, about the end days. That's such a good point because... There are many of us that were just kind of happy going along to get along. And like I said before, riding the fence halfway in the world, halfway in God's camp and trying to almost live out that prosperity gospel type thing where uh, I'm just I'm succeeding in this world. I've got my large house and white picket fence and two and a half kids and a dog and two cars and, you know, my country club membership. You know, a lot of us got a little too, you know, resting on our laurels a bit and, um, you know, the scriptures are real clear. Peter said that judgment begins at the house of God. And, you know, some of this is coming on us to wake us up from our lethargic rest on our laurels, just go along, go along for the ride mentality instead of really digging into the Lord and seeing that this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of this life, pride of life is not um, where we need to be. We need to be um, separate in the world, but not of the world and part of the kingdom of God. And you know, that that takes a focus that many of us had lost. And one thing's for certain, when you look into the eyes of your Jezebel, who hates you so much that she's willing to steal your child or your children and do this level of abuse, uh, you are definitely going to recognize there's evil and you're going to seek God. There, there's so many people that have contacted this ministry, got saved through all this because of what happened. And those that weren't as close as they needed to be got closer and those who were close got even closer and stronger and learned about spiritual warfare and other things they didn't know about. So God takes all things that the devil means for evil and, and turns them uh, for our good. And that's that's the amazing thing about him. And if it serves to draw us closer to him and to get right and to get on that uh, narrow and a road to the straight gate that leads to everlasting life, then so be it. Bring it. Bring it. Uh, that's what I say. Whatever it takes to keep me going in that direction— um, please, by all means, Father, let it happen. Let me give a warning to the listeners out there that if you know somebody who aids and abets a Jezebel, who aids and abets the, the, the kidnapping of a child or children or the legal kidnapping of a, which I call legal, you know, when the courts do it, uh, and alienation from children, clearly child abuse, but let's be clear about something. What does Isaiah go on to say in 59? What does God say throughout the word of God? It's going to happen. What does God say in Revelation with Jezebel's followers? Death, Do not judgment. Be deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. When you aid and abet somebody, if you, if you know anybody who has done this or is doing this, you need to give them a stern warning because judgment is coming. You say, well, God's God's not a God of judgment. Yes, he is. He has to be. He can't be a God of mercy without being a God of judgment. He is a God of mercy, but you have to have judgment in order to appreciate mercy. What did Jesus say? When you cause harm, emotional, physical, sexual, when you cause harm to little children, it would be better for you to have a millstone. See, a millstone was very large and heavy. For you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the depths of the sea. So let's give warning to, to people. If you're doing this or you know somebody's doing this, it doesn't turn out well for these people in the end. And if you can contact the person that is the victim and you know what's going on in their life and you know what the Jezebel is up to and you can reveal to them some information because usually the victims are completely isolated in the dark and they have no information. They don't know what's going on. 
But if you can be a source of information for that person, I highly encourage you to call them. You know, some people don't even know where their kids are and uh, or, or if they're even still alive. And if you know what that Jezebel is up to and you can reveal uh, the truth to the victim and be an encouragement, I mean, please don't just sit there and lay back and not do anything, even though, you know, the Jezebel is wrong. Try to be a, a, a helper and a secure to the, the victim. Chad, I'll ask you this question. What would you say if in the first six months of all of this, when you felt so alone and ostracized and, and falsely accused, if someone had just come to you and, and, and tried to reach out and to comfort you and to say, hey, I see what's happening. I know this is wrong. What would that have done for you? I think that would be incredible. It would be just absolutely knock it out of the park amazing. One person, just one person to come from, in my situation, two different churches. Just one person. One is a 3,000 membership and another is about a 200 membership. One person to come out of this and say, man, I, I, I see completely what's going on. Um, I'm praying for you. I'm here with you. Or I've got some intel. Here's what's going on. Or I interact with your children and I'm going to do my best to be a light in their life and encourage them to be with you and understand that there's two sides to a story and they shouldn't be in the middle of this or something, anything. Even minute to to a little more of what we just said, but I got nothing, and still barely really any of that has happened yet, and it's been much longer than six months. Two things I want to say to that. You had even been in leadership. You had been a deacon there, so it wasn't like you were just a guy that sat in the back row that nobody knew. Everybody knew you. Yeah, 14 years of being a deacon in this large church, and very involved, very well known. Super involved, very well known. You knew all the pastors, the leadership, everything. And then the second thing I'll say about that is that it is clear that Jezebel has taken over a church where no support is provided to the victim of Jezebel. It's like when Jezebel had that man with the field. What was his name Nabioth? I can't remember his name, but he had the field that Ahab wanted. Ahab would not. He would not sell it to Ahab, and then Jezebel had uh, everybody um, honor this guy and make a feast for him, and then had him killed. And uh, it's just amazing how everybody will rally around Jezebel and nobody will stand with the person uh, that's the victim. But if you think about it, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. You know, he had a few of his disciples there watching, but there wasn't much they could do to support him. And they're just watching him being taken to the cross. And everybody else is rallying around the evil that was what the Pharisees and Sadducees were doing. I had both. <clears throat> I, I had, we were, you know, small country church, but we were a big small country church at the time. My children's mother, along with an atheist professor, went on a letter writing campaign. So I was just devastated. We had 11 beautiful years of marriage to, to planned biological children uh, after five years into the marriage. And one we brought in as a foster son that would eventually, I would eventually adopt, brought him in at eight months old. Um, and he's eight years old now. Uh, I was devastated, and I took six weeks out of the pulpit just because I, I just couldn't, I was just numb. But in the meantime, uh, she took a, a husband and wife. The, the woman was a trustee and played in our praise band, and uh, the husband was a deacon, and she convinced them of I was just a bad guy. No, Nothing in particular, no, no you know, Although, you know, she had gone to our church secretary, our CPS liaison through foster parenting, and told both of them uh, that I had never been abusive in any way, verbally, physically, emotionally. I was a good dad, a good husband. Uh, she just needed a change in her life. Both of those women testified in, in court and said as much. They said, oh, they didn't help. So in, in the meantime, they go on this letter writing campaign along with a, a couple of other people that she just convinced to get on her side. Uh, and it devastated her church. I mean, we, we got down to about a dozen people. We thought we were going to have to close the doors of the church. But God had other plans. God provided the whole time. And when I was able to get back into the pulpit, I asked. So I had all these people turn on me, even a couple of just best friends who testified against me in court. One just made up the most absurd lies you've ever heard of. And then another... Never read it, 
really said anything bad. It just painted a negative picture of me. On the other hand, the remnant of people that stayed, I got in, in the pulpit, which was very difficult to do. And I said, what do you want me to do? I said, I will be divorced, um, barring a miracle. And a lot of churches don't want a divorced pastor. Now, we're a community church, so we have a lot of different backgrounds in our church. And one by one, they stood up and they said, we, we want you to stay. One, one lady stood up and said, she told me you had never done anything wrong and that you were a good guy, a good dad, a good husband, but she just needed to do what was best for her. She needed to change. So you haven't done anything illegal, immoral, or unethical. If you can't stay, we want you to stay. And our eldest members in her 80s stood up. She said, Pastor, she said, please stay. She said, if you think you can stay, we'll pastor you for a while. Oh, wow. That's yeah. amazing. And they, they did. They pastored their pastor. They were devastated, too, you know. But, but the church was being the church. There was one woman who she was calling people who had left our church years ago and even moved to other towns. And finally, the people started, they, they started hearing ahead of time what was going on, and they cut her off. And they said, I'm not going to talk to you about this. You need to quit what you're doing. What you're doing is sin. And so they stood up to some of these people as well. So I, I saw both, to answer your question. I, I, I saw people turn uh, on a dime and just like a rabid dog turn on you. But I also saw people step in and defend and encourage and build. So, so it was a little bit of both for me. It was amazing you were left with 12 people. You had the 12 uh, disciples who were left, uh, the only ones that didn't run away. But, the, you know, uh, it was still a smaller percentage of those that stuck around. And amazing, these people that you had pastored all those years that just automatically believed the Jezebel's lies. And it, it just goes to show you how easily persuaded some people are. How spiritually fickle they are. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 one was I mean one was a deacon, and his wife was you know a long time member. They never they so never they, came to you with a letter and, and gave you a chance to explain or to refute. They just disappear, right? The the deacon met with me and accused me. We had two deacons at the time. He met with our chairman of the deacons, and and he accused me of all these things. And when he got through, and mind you, it's, it's, it's 20 minutes before I'm getting up to preach. This, it's always perfect time. You know, it's always the <laughs> best time to confront your pastor. <laughs> so not really. Uh, and and when, he said, when he got done, I said, okay, can, can I defend those things? Well, you don't need to. And I said, well, none of the things that you said are true, but you, you don't want to know my side of the story. And even the other deacon agreed. He said, no, that's out of line. He said, you come in here and accusing him. Why didn't you ask him if these things took place? And they're all just little little stuff, you know. But many of those people didn't want to know the truth. But the majority of people that left just didn't want to be part of it. You know, she she tried to drag them into it, and you know, there was once she tried to organize a meeting with all these people, and the spiritual people said, "I'm not going to attend that. It's not biblical." You know, and the the grounded people confronted, and, and you know, she made them out to be the devil. One was a a, a neighbor, and, a, and and she was a pastor's wife and friend. And she got a hold of her at the beginning of all this. She got with her, and this pastor's wife said, you're out of line. You need to work this thing out because you don't have biblical grounds to do this. Or she ran her into the ground and, you know, made her name mud. Well, Ken, I've learned a little bit of new stuff you just shared that I haven't heard from you before. But knowing a lot of details you have shared with me, I think about how long term looking this through, your church survived and it thrived. It's doing well. You have built up a new membership, great people who love you and encourage you. Um, you're, you're pressing on. You're being a, a good uh, shepherd to your sheep. And I know the story of the other side. And um, I'm only hearing it from you, but I'm telling you that it's revealing long term in the heat of the moment, sometimes there's confusion. You're swatting at these flies or flying monkeys. Everyone's skeptical. They just can't make heads or tails of the situation because so many crazy, bizarre things have been said by the Jezebel or the narc if it's a woman that's being beat up in the situation. But long term, I think, sometimes it takes a little time. You know, even in my situation, there is pure evidence and proof of 
the fact that sin has continued. There is great evidence that one side is pressing on doing the good things and and saying the good things and, and trying to follow Christ. The other is continuing to go deeper in the rabbit hole of sin and lies and distortion and confusion and conniving. Just all the all the bad stuff just continues on that path with the other side. So I don't know if that's the case with everyone's situation, but I'm seeing it in yours and in mine. Well, and there's where you have to completely rely on faith. You know, a lot of these a lot of these dads do commit suicide, and you 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 understand why. I, on the other hand, have resolved from the beginning that, for one, I've got to keep fighting for my daughters, but I've got a son to raise that nobody's helping raise. You know, he's already abandoned by his first parents and then by his mother of five years at the time, the only mother I ever knew. So I have to live for these kids, but most importantly, I have to live for the Lord because the Lord's got a story in this for all of us. He's got a story in this someday, whether we write a book or we speak about it or, or whatever it is. You have to rely on by faith that God is going to clear your name someday. Psalm 37, what did David say? He, he said, don't, don't, don't worry about the wicked or, or envy any of those that do wrong because someday soon they'll fade away. Whatever that means, it means they're not, one of these days they're not going to be a, a problem for you anymore. Um, and then, you know, he, he says again in Psalm 37 that he, he's seen these wicked and ruthless people, and they flourish for for time. Mm. But then you turn around and look, and they're not there. So, you That's, know, the whole point is you, you have to rely on faith that God is going to make make this right someday. That he, you know, Isaiah, what is it, 54, where it says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Um, and, and he says, you'll be vindicated. And so you have to rely on faith. I've had to rely on faith. And I'm still fighting. I still don't have custody of my girls. But I have to rely on faith that God's going to make it right because that's what he does. That's his nature. That's his character. We've talked about how corrupt our courts have become. And I even felt led to make a video sort of at the beginning of this ministry. It's probably three years old now. But the title was Taking the Narc Jez to Heaven's Court because that's the place where justice is going to occur And that's where Psalm 37 is going to bear itself out. And I want to read a little bit of that since you brought it up. It says in verse 1 of Psalm 37, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as a light and thy judgment in the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's the key. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And so... That's one thing the three of us have certainly had to do is is wait and trust God, because even if we do get in the court, even if we did have the best attorney, even if we did represent ourselves right, there's no guarantee these corrupt courts are going to come in line. You know, the only thing that we can count on is that God knows the truth. He knows the whole of the truth. He has perfect just judgment and he will bring these things to pass. And he is he is patient. With the wicked, and he's asking us to be patient because he's giving them chance after chance to repent. And I think he does that, and there's psalms that speak to this, because eternity in hell is forever, and there's no getting out. And there, once you punch that ticket, it's done. And I think when he knows people are going there forever, that he gives them time after time after time to repent so that they have a chance to avoid it. God, God, It's not God's will that anyone should go to hell or to the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. And I think that we just have to keep that in mind and and keep trusting the Father to lead us to do what we need to do and when to do it and and put our trust in him. There are things that we have to do and we should do, but it's just making sure we're being led of the Holy Spirit, not of the flesh, and not responding uh, uh, from the flesh and being led of the Lord. We know that in his court that the just judgment is, is occurring and he is 
executing it on our behalf. And we just have to wait and be patient. And it's going to come to pass, as you said. Well, we started with with, with Isaiah 59. And what, what does he say toward the end of, of that chapter? The Lord looked and he was displeased that there was no justice. And he was, he was amazed to see that nobody would step in for those being oppressed. And it says, so he himself stepped in with his strong arm. That's right. And, and his justice sustained him. And then it kind of parallels the, the armor of God, Ephesians 6. But it says that he, he clothed himself with a robe of vengeance and, and, a, and a cloak of, a, of divine passion. And that he'll repay his enemies for what they've done. And I believe, and you guys can comment on this, but I believe that we were created for a desire for justice. Because in Psalm 10, Psalm 37, Psalm 45, God says that he loves justice. And I believe that we have programmed in us by God a desire for justice. If we didn't, then why do we love the movies that we love? And we, we love movies where in the end it works out, it turns out, and there is justice in the end. We love those kind of movies and books and novels because we were created for justice. And God is going to bring justice, whether it you know starts with the tribulation or, or for us personally. He, he's going to bring justice. It's like all these instant karma videos on YouTube that show bully, bullies getting beaten up when they start things with people that don't want to fight. <laughs> people do enjoy watching that stuff, but I think the thing about true justice is once you're born again and you, from partaking of the word, begin to work your discernment be free, between right and wrong, you have this proper discernment of what is just and what is right. You know, Paul berated, I think it might have been the Corinthians, because he said, can no one there among you, you know, bring proper judgment? Can't you pick the least among you to, to judge these matters? Why go to you? Why go to the world's courts system? And he's berating them about that. And we we among ourselves should be able to do that. And so many people have tried to use the church to to settle matters and they go there and these Satanists that are in the pulpits a lot of times, they're not going to get in the middle of it. We're not going to, we're not going to dirty our hands with your, with your issues and your family, with your wife, but you need to go get yourself an attorney instead of just dealing with justice on the church level. What do you think, Chad? I agree. I think that's what the stance is in most of modern day churches today. Actually, in my situation, it was um, nearly that, except for one of the pastors injected himself into the situation in multiple ways, and to a point where he is my pastor, my counselor, he wants to go on the stand as a witness against me to keep my children from me and do destroy destruction towards my family. This man is a Satanist. He is horrific. He, he's awful. He's the, posing as a Christian pastor at this 3,000-member church. And the funny thing is is that they never really want to hear your side. They don't ever really pull you aside or get you in meetings where you're both talking about it. They'll shut you down just like the judges will in the courts. I begged this church to get me and all parties involved into a meeting with elders, pastors, and deacons and get to the bottom of this, and they all refused to hear me. It all fell on deaf ears. They ignored me, but to the point, not only did they ignore my request to get involved, they did get involved with this one pastor, so-called pastor, who wants to go in the courtroom and testify against me without knowing my side of the story at all and, and following what the scriptures say to do. And the church is condoning this. I, I reached out to the church afterwards, and beg them to get involved again, knowing that he's trying to get into the courtroom on the behalf of this church. And there was even another one that called you and attacked you, said, says he was a prophet, that attacked you. He said, you, you did a whole bunch of wrong. And when you said, can you please be specific? He could give you no specifics. They, don't, exactly. they can't specifically tell you what you did wrong because they have this whole blur of accusation from the Jezebel who lied through her teeth and never really specified anything. Any, anyway, they just blanket state that you're, you're a bad person. 
and then they'll pepper it with some false accusations in there, or they'll take some small thing that you did that wasn't exactly right and maximize that to make it way worse than it really was. The, no, the, the people that have aided and abetted to, to Jezebel's through the alienation and abuse of, of, of our children, they're going to answer for it. But Chad, these church leaders have a double accountability to God. That's true. And, and they will answer for it. They will answer for every wrong word of counsel they've given. If we're going to answer for every word in heaven, you can count on it and bank on it. We're going to answer for our counsel here. To, to whom much and is given, he, much is expected. Absolutely. And those church leaders, are they're going to answer this side of heaven. I can guarantee that they will, unless they repent. That's right. Just to conclude, that's kind of the point, you know, that we've, we've determined through this talk that the courts are corrupted. The Bible predicted they would be. We've determined that it's important to take your case to heaven's court and to wait on the Lord. And all of these people that were in bed, metaphorically speaking, with the Jezebel, they're going to inherit the same thing she's going to inherit, or if it's a male narc, they're all going to inherit the same thing. And it's not going to go well for them. It's not, it's not going to go well. It's going to be really, really brutal. And for the most part, the Christians got to eat his broccoli before he gets to his dessert. And to use just a very simple analogy there, but they get their dessert first. They get every, it seems like everything goes their way at first. It's all going their way. They get your kids, which they're still miserable as to Ken's earlier point, but in the end, they're going to have to eat their broccoli and it's not going to taste good. It's going to be rotten broccoli at that point. Well, guys, I really appreciate you guys being here today. I think um, we had a, a good discussion. I think that the whole, we can't just, say the courts are corrupt and not give hope because our hope is in Jesus and what he did for us and what he's doing for us Amen. and his just judgment. Our hope is in God, the father and his son, Jesus Christ by the Holy spirit. And we are so fortunate and blessed to have that. And, you know, many of people in the Bible have gone through what we went through. Abraham had to give up Ishmael. Abraham almost had to give up Isaac um, Jacob uh, lost um, Joseph, and so there have been, and of course, Jacob himself had to leave his father Isaac. So we know that in all, all of the uh, fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three experienced the loss of children being in their lives. And I know the one thing that Ken said earlier that I'm going to kind of pivot off of here is that when something like that happens, what are you going to do? Are you going to draw closer to the Lord when you lose the most important thing in your life? Are you going to use it and, and say, you know, I love you, Lord, even more than my, my child, more than my spouse, more than my parents, more than all these people? You know, Jesus said, if you love your father, mother, spouse, sister, brother, or, or daughter, son, more than him, you're not worthy of him. And so are you going to use these moments to draw in closer to the Lord, put your trust in him? And let him do what he did in Joseph's life, uh, where he he went into into slavery and then was thrown into the prison and then in a single day became made became governor over all the land. Are you going to have the fortitude to stick with the Lord and not give up on the Lord during those times? And I think that's the number one thing that should come out of this is trying to make peace with the person that's taking you to court. But if you can't trusting the Lord and getting in, getting what you need to get done in there as quickly as possible and get out and try to do so in a way that doesn't enslave you to their, to their system and, and then put your trust in the Lord and let him uh, deal with the matters. Uh, and when you do that, you can have peace even in the midst of the storm. You can have um, his love, his joy, um, his peace that passes all understanding. You can have all of those things um, even in the midst of all this, by just continuing to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. If you do that first, the rest will be taken care of. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But it does require patiently waiting. It does require being obedient while you're waiting, and being do what you need to do as led of the Lord, but being patient and waiting patiently, and God will bring it to pass. He really will. So, um, I want to thank Chad. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me.
My pleasure. Ken, thanks for being here. Well, it was it was an honor to, to discuss things with you two. We appreciate having you, and we give God all the praise and glory because he sure is holding on to us as we hold on to him. You know, He'll never leave or forsake us, and he'll never let go of us. We can walk out of his hand, but we, we're choosing to walk with him, and he grips us real tight, so we just praise him for that. So I'll just conclude with prayer. Father God, I just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to just speak about these matters plainly and openly and just to try to encourage each other and everyone listening that wherever they are in their walk and their situation, especially if they're dealing in uh, man's courts, Father, I'm just asking you to deal with each and every person's situation who's watching um, in your court and to bring just judgment to their situation. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father God, for all of these people that are suffering uh, injustices and, and, and lack of proper judgment in their situation by those who uh, have been given some sort of authority or power over it. I thank you for turning their turning the ship, Father God, in the right direction and causing your just judgment to come forth in uh, their matters. I pray all these things in my name of Jesus. If you like the music you're hearing, you can download it for free at the Reverb Nation link below. If you want to see our blog spot, it's a link below too, without spot or blemish.blogspot.com. If you'd like to donate, everything we do is free, including ministry calls and prayer prayer responses and so on uh you uh, that's all free everything we do is free but you can donate at the paypal link below and uh we would love to hear from you at without spot at gmail.com if you'd like to write us sorry for any delays in getting back to you um we've been getting a big influx of, of emails so please forgive us for being um somewhat delayed in responding but we'd love to hear from you and thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the next podcast for without spot of blemish ministry us in the name of his son the battle he won so we're bringing in sheaves it's time to reap the harvest of men fish them out of the sea of destruction show them the way out of satan's grip Lift them up into God's holy ship. Can you see people trapped in the loop? Spinning their wheels, but they can't break through. Death and blind, they can't hear or see. We have to pray for them, that God's love will set them free. It's time to reap the harvest of men, fish them out. Of the sea of destruction, show them the way. Out of Satan's grip, lift them up into God's holy ship. that beam out of your eye so you can help your friends